The premise for Puppet Combo's 2017 title, Buzzsaw Bloodhouse, has always creeped me out on not only a creative, but an existential level as well. It's a Halloween survival horror game about a twisted Red Room livestream in which young girls are kidnapped and forced to traverse a house full of difficult to navigate, deadly, inconceivably cruel traps from the most quickly rejected pitch for a season of Wipeout, just for the twisted, perverted entertainment of its viewers. The circumstance behind the story is that on Halloween night of 1997, a group of young girls walking home from school spot a van, and as soon as one of the girls comments on how odd it is, the van drives directly towards them. A figure with a distorted voice tells them to get into the van, and they're subsequently taken to the house, and the player wakes up in the room at the beginning of the obstacle course with a ski mask wielding maniac with a chainsaw chasing after the girls at any given moment, and obviously not helping with their situation. The player then has to traverse the traps that were too much cop for even the Saw franchise to handle, in hopes of absconding the house. While the house in question might be the magnum opus of sadistic depravity, it's always the concept of the website that was broadcasting this show that's been the element that imbued itself under my skin and never fully vacated. This got me wondering. Could a presentation like this exist somewhere on the internet? Are there situations and or resources where someone could stream this to an audience whose viewership is regulated or not? Would it be possible to set up sadistically sustainable shared savagery supplemented by seemingly psychopathic saw? Can something like this happen in real life? This is, is Buzzsaw Bloodhouse possible? English scientist Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web in 1989. He wrote the first web browser in 1990 while employed at CERN near Geneva, Switzerland. The browser was released outside CERN to other research institutions starting in January of 1991 and then to the general public in August of 1991. The web began to enter everyday use in 93 to 94 when websites for general use started to become available, with it being central to the development of the information age and as the primary tool billions of people use to interact on the internet. The deep web where the show is supposedly hosted on are certain parts of the world wide web whose contents aren't readily indexed by standard web search engines and are hidden behind HTTP forums, and includes many very common uses such as webmail, online banking, private or otherwise restricted access social media pages and profiles, some web forums that require registration for viewing content, and services that users must pay for, and which are protected by pay walls, such as video on demand and some online magazines and newspapers, but can be located and accessed by a direct URL, IP address, or archiver, but may need a password or some other security clearance to get past public website pages, i.e. can immediately be accessed by a quick search. There's a reason a database of the entirety of JP Morgan and Chase's transactions reside on the deep web instead of the surface web. As you might be thinking, this is an immensely broad category of the web, seeing as any Anything from an unlisted YouTube video to a college e-learning site to an FBI watch list would be considered the deep web, which with enough attempts and questionably invasive tactics, authorities could get access to, which brings us to an even thicker layer of security and more involuted digital environments for law enforcement to clear, the dark web. The World Wide Web content that exists on dark nets, which are overlay networks that use the internet but need specific software and or authorization to access, making better sense semantically if we're to believe the show is being hosted on something that warrants a special type of system. Open source applications like the Tor browser let people anonymously browse the web by using its overlay network consisting of more than a thousand relays to mask their location and usage from anyone conducting network surveillance or traffic analysis. The 1960s to 1990s highlighted a growing demand for both private internet access away from the government eye and easy accessibility of any content that one desired. Tor was the answer to both these demands. Though development of Tor began in the late 1990s, it didn't fully spawn the growth of the dark web until its release in 2002. In the 1990s, researchers David Goldschlag, Mike Reed, and Paul Siverson at the US Naval Research Lab began developing a way of routing traffic through the internet as anonymously as possible in response to growing concern over the lack of security on the internet. This lack of security, in part due to how new the internet was, created nightmares about government tracking and surveillance. Goldschlag, 
Reed, and Siversen aimed to route internet traffic anonymously through multiple servers and encrypt it along the way, calling their idea Onion Routing, in reference to the multiple layers undertaken by it. When Tor was released in 2002, it was purposely kept as a free and open software. This was so the software could easily be accessible to those who wanted it, and so it could rely on a decentralized network for maximum security. As Tor gained popularity, its users started demanding that its creators address censorship by allowing those living under oppressive governments to publish their thoughts and access restricted websites freely. This motivated Tor's creators to start developing a way for its network to get around government firewalls so its users could access government restricted websites. Though Tor's creators had noble intentions, seeing as they made the platform free and built it to address government censorship, they continued to run into another problem. Its platform was highly complex and technical, restricting usage to mostly tech-savvy users. This discovery led to Tor's creators to begin developing a solution to Tor's accessibility issues. In 2008, a Tor browser began to be developed, which would make Tor both easily accessible and user-friendly. Once the Tor browser was released, it was only a matter of time until more and more dark websites would begin to pop up. With the release of private browsing networks like Tor, collections of dark websites and a subsequent community of followers began to emerge in full force. Though many dark web websites were formed to help those living under oppressive governments push back against censorship, the temptation of having a corner of the internet where you could browse anonymously fueled a rise in the number of dark websites that hosted illegal content. If you'd like to engross yourself into more about this subject, I'm gonna leave a link and a card to the Some Ordinary Gamers video discussing this, since I I think Mudahar does a fantastic job at explaining it. One could already see why this is liable to facilitate criminal activity because of its identity concealing nature and ability to obstruct law enforcement from preventing what is objectively immoral behavior perpetrated by detestable and morally abhorrent scumbags. One popularly held belief, albeit a speculative one, of what resides on the dark web are red rooms, online streams depicting people being tortured in various ways for people's sadistic entertainment. The closest urban legend we can get to the game in question, with Buzzsaw Bloodhouse being a heavily modified version of the Red Room Torture Chamber being an entire house full of traps. Think live leak, but actually live. Are Red Rooms real? In his recent book on the subject, Jamie Bartlett chronicles the tales of among other things, suicide, CP, drug trading, white supremacy, and harassment. But those are, unfortunately, things you can also find on the open internet. By and large, it would seem the dark web doesn't go much deeper than that. Are Red Rooms real? Asked one frustrated Redditor. I read about this subject, but I found no evidence. It seems like a legend, not something that really happens. Perhaps the better question is, why so many people are fascinated by these grotesque urban legends, let alone driven to seek them out? That, alas, is something philosophers and psychologists are still arguing about. If you need further elucidation, listen to some ordinaries Mudahar explain it again. I'm right gonna tell you that the kind of stuff that you're witnessing on this entire situation uh, is basically <laughs> all, all just a scam, all just a joke. There's never been a recorded proof of a deep web red room, somebody actually being murdered and tortured in front of your eyes, live through the deep web. Because simply, it's not a technologically possible, and I'll tell you that in, in a second too in a bit when we go to the deep web but in a lot of ways if it had existed me with my hundreds of hours of browsing would have found this crazy stuff to you there's nothing that has ever been proven in this case the realest sounding scenario was way back in the day when they claimed to have like isis soldiers captured and were ready to behead and kill and i think nothing came out of that scenario the the, the situation never occurred the bitcoins were sent the money was siphoned the fraud was committed so, no, red rooms have never really been proven, and if we're going by these as a realistic estimate, they've never been proven. Now, so no, it's profusely clear that there's no genuinely documented evidence that dark web red rooms actually exist. Therefore, we can come to the conclusion that they aren't real, as there's no tangible evidence to support they are. But anything claiming to be such a thing, or even something else commonly concomitant with the dark web, is at maximum involvement, an untraceable currency scam making its designer bank and 
terms of passive money or at maximum involvement, federal honeypots designed as stings to catch criminals. Scientific modus, or whatever the hell. So by extension, it's safe to conclude that even though both dark web and clear web illicit activity has been occurring within the allotted time frame, from the internet's conception to 1997, there was and now is no documented evidence of a show featuring a live broadcast of young girls navigating difficult and deadly rooms with obstacles designed to kill them with a lunatic sometimes chasing them around with a chainsaw. So although the homicidal maniacs in the audience might be disappointed in putting something that's been on my mind for so long to rest, those of you terrified that there might be such a disgusting waste of bandwidth and something to give live streaming a bad name can rest easy from now on knowing that if a suspicious van pulls up right in front of you, Twitch but for serial killers isn't going to be the last place people see you alive, and that anything purporting to be an actual torture show is definitely some sort of Bitcoin scam. So feel free to walk around outside late on Halloween, so long as you're either wearing a mask or fully vaccinated, because there are plenty of trick-or-treaters for creeps and vans to prey upon. Or you could be a cave-dwelling troglodyte like me, never going outside and wasting his life on YouTube. Teach their own. But no matter what you do, stay safe online and stay safe in real life.